Okay, everyone. Uh, that was a short minute, I know, but this is your last presentation before our lunch break. So um, welcome back and we'll get started in just a second. Um, just wanna give a shout out if Hillary can hear me and if you're nearby. I'm here, Sarah. Yay, okay, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> okay. Um, Welcome back, everyone. This is the uh, last portion of our agenda today before our lunch break. Um, two quick updates. One is um, the bios to all the speakers are in the chat. So please look for that if you're curious to get more information on each of our speakers from both this morning as well as this afternoon. And secondly, as I am here in Seattle and I am presenting on the traditional lands of the Duwamish people in the Seattle region. Um, we, Hillary and I are the team of executive coordinators here at the uh, Veda Environmental and we've been uh, carrying on this work for about a decade. So we're gonna tag team our presentation today. I'll do the introductions and a couple of slides and then hand it off to her for some of the projects that she's managing and uh, we'll kind of go back and forth that way. Um, so with that, I'll hit to the next slide. Um, we are, the task force is an organization made up of the spill response programs across the five Western states and British Columbia listed here. You've now heard from each of the executive members of those jurisdictions. And uh, we have been in the world since 1989 and uh, continue to our work of coordination and collaboration in uh, prevention, preparedness, and response across the region. Um, whoop, there's my advanced thing. Our work includes collaborating with many, many partners, including the oil industry response companies, public interest groups, local and state governments, as well as tribes and indigenous nations, US and Canadian federal agencies, associations, and the public. Um, this work Care is carried out through various work groups, through meetings, through workshops and forums and roundtables. And so we continue to strive to share information out and learn from our partners as well. And uh, that's kind of the foundation of, of, of our, our world. Um, we have a strategic plan that was revised in 2019. Our vision is no spilled oil. Our mission is working together to improve the Pacific Coast prevention, preparedness, response, and recovery from oil spills. We have five core goals that drive our work. The first is to adapt to changes in oil movement and risks. The second is to advance readiness and capacity to respond to oil spills. The third is to deepen our partnerships to make better decisions and expand our knowledge. The fourth is to build and enhance visibility and relevancy of the task force. And finally, we have a goal to nurture our organizational health. And our work is driven by three core goal kind of uh, themes, which are a safe and clean environment, external partnerships, and organizational well being. So these goals are the foundation of our biennial work plans. And so every two years, we put together uh, the work of the following. Uh, biennium that covers prevention, preparedness, response, communications, and of course, kind of taking care of our organization. And so um, it's been quite a year. Uh, we've shifted our perspectives greatly through this pandemic process. It's changed a lot of the ways in which we engage and work together. Um, nearly all of our work as an organization has shifted to the virtual platform. And in some cases, there's really no going back. Uh, we've gained a lot of efficiencies that way from travel and also, um, you know, resources and time of people's avail you know, time for, for getting to meetings and so forth. Um, and we've also gained kind of a larger population at some attendance in some of our events, which is a really nice silver lining to doing things virtually. Um, but at the same time, losing the connections and the one-to-one the -one in person engagement, there's no replacement for it. So we're we're imagining a future where this will be kind of a hybrid approach going forward. Um, so at this point, I'm going to start us off in the work in our prevention realm. Um, we are covering some of our work, not all of it in this presentation. So 
do visit our task force website and take a look at our work plan and you'll get a sense of kind of the breadth and scale of all of the work we're doing. But today is sort of touching on some of our um, significant pieces of work that are underway. So with that, I'll hand it over to Hillary Wilkinson, who's, as I mentioned before, she's um, my colleague on the executive coordinator team, and she will walk you through the next couple of slides. Great, thank you so much, Sarah. It's great to be here today. I'm gonna to talk about a couple of things, uh, projects that I lead, starting with the issue of abandoned and derelict vessels, which continues to be a very challenging topic across our task force jurisdictions and remains a priority issue as it has been since 2017. So next slide, please. Next oh, slide. Sorry, yep, sorry. Got yeah, it. Here's my go-to on advancing the slides. Yeah. Uh, you, you heard about this incident from Tom earlier today, the American Challenger, uh, that year should be 2021. But anyway, <laughs> uh, the American Challenger is, you'll hear more about it from Tom in a little bit, I think. But it's one of just many, many, many ADVs that I consider to be poster children. I could just shuffle through hundreds of slides and share with you the types of challenges that the task force jurisdictions are facing. But they share some common themes, those themes being um, programs that are funded to address recreational vessels and not commercial vessels. And so commercial vessels remaining on the rocks and stranded because there's no state funding to remove them. Um, there's themes of owners of vessels not having insurance at, for removal um, once they've been wrecked or abandoned. And so them remaining on the rocks or in marinas and places like that. And lots and lots of other challenging themes that the, the jurisdictions are facing. Next slide, please. So I mentioned we started focusing on abandoned and derelict vessels back in 2017. We formed a really great work group that was comprised of ADV program leads and experts from the task force jurisdictions. And those folks got together, put their brains together and came out first with this white paper back in 2019, which essentially assessed the scope and scale of the problem across the West Coast and tried to look elsewhere to see what was working in other states that could be maybe adopted out on the West Coast. And one of the major takeaways from developing this white paper in 2019 was that the scope and scale of the problem is massive. It's incredibly expensive. Every jurisdiction has dozens of commercial vessels, hundreds of recreational vessels still to be dealt with, not even to mention the constant inflow of new ADVs and the cost of removal is just exorbitant. And as I mentioned, there's just common themes of like jurisdictional authority challenges, lack of funding, et cetera, et cetera. So this, this white paper kind of helped set the stage for the next phase of our work group's work, which was to develop a um, comprehensive blue ribbon program across the West Coast. So Sarah, if you could advance to the next slide. And this Blue Ribbon program was intended to kind of create a framework for a model program that could be adopted by the West Coast states. And I say state, the task force, as you know, includes the province of BC, but as Laura mentioned earlier, ADVs in Canada are regulated at the federal level because of their jurisdiction over the marine waters. And so our focus is on the US states where the states have a huge amount of responsibility around dealing with ADVs. So we, uh, our work group, started working on this Blue Ribbon program. And next slide, please, Sarah. And we published it on the very um, unfortunate date of mid-January 2020. We, uh, we thought we were gonna get a big splash and a lot of interest in this report. And ultimately we did, but we unfortunately coincided with the start of a global pandemic. So it took quite a bit longer to get the attention of the people that, whose attention we wanted, which was, uh, congressional delegates, elected officials at the federal and state levels, program managers within the state jurisdictions, reporters, lots of other people. So we did a pretty significant lift during 2020 to get this out in front of people. And we finally did, but again, competing with um, people's attention on the pandemic. Next slide, please. Oops. So, uh, and Sarah, you can just kind of click through to bring up everything on the slide here. Essentially, our Blue Ribbon Program contains 33 recommendations for the states to develop comprehensive ADV programs at the state level. 
And they cover these five topic areas, authorities, prevention, funding, removal and deconstruction, public outreach and education. But our Blue Ribbon Program also contains six recommendations for our federal partners. And they range from things like, please increase funding to support the states in implementing these statewide programs. Um, and also things like when federal vessels are transferred to new owners, make sure that those new owners have insurance, have proper financial um, standing to be able to maintain the vessels over time, things like that. And one of the kind of outcomes that we're facing sort of moving forward is this recognition that this problem is so big and so complicated and so expensive and so pervasive <laughs> and getting worse that there's no question that it's going to require a very strong partnership between the states and the federal government. And I'm really happy to report that we were having very constructive conversations with our federal partners and in fact, had a long conversation about them with this with them just yesterday. And we're continuing to sort of figure out how to move forward with this. So next slide, please, Sarah. So speaking of the next steps, kind of coming off the heels of our conversation yesterday and just other things that have been coming to light. In 2022, um, we are going to reconfigure our ADV work group, which in its initial formation was about identifying the problem and trying to uh, like come up with what a solution would be. Now that we have what we consider to be a pretty good solution, um, we wanna move into an implementation phase. So we'll be reconfiguring that work group to kind of address implementation. And we're gonna be inviting in people from the federal government, from state government, from nonprofit organizations, from um, industry, anybody who really has a handle on this issue and working on this issue and thinks you can bring some ideas to the table to help us with this tricky implementation phase, figuring out how to prioritize, move forward, be strategic. We welcome people. So please contact me separately if you're interested in uh, serving on our newly reconfigured ADV work group. Um, another thing we'll be doing in 2022 is hosting a couple, couple things. First, which is here on the screen, is we're going to have a round table where we're going to invite the state program leads and others in to highlight where they're making some progress in implementing the recommendations in our Blue Ribbon Report. Um, one awesome area of progress that I like to highlight is what Oregon is doing with the NOAA Marine Debris Grant, where they are really starting to tackle the issue of ADVs within the state's marinas. Um, through this very innovative approach, um, which you can learn about online. But um, that's the kind of thing that we like to highlight because there is a lot of progress being made, a long way to go. But we wanna highlight some of those areas of progress. And we're also gonna host a kind of um, workshop, probably virtual, where we can really start to think about our strategic steps moving forward in implementation. How, how do we start tackling this and implementing some of these recommendations? Um, and continue our efforts, oh, that right. kind of continuing our efforts on the federal recommendations. Okay, moving on. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Right. Apologies. So that's, there's a lot to be said about ADVs, but I will pivot to the next topic area that I cover for the task force, which is chairing the Pacific Oil Spill Prevention and Education Team, otherwise known as POSPET. Uh, this is a group primarily of Alaska, or sorry, of BC, California, Oregon, and Washington representatives. We'd very much like to have some Hawaii and Alaska representatives. So if you're interested in joining POSPET, let me know. It's a group of um, individuals and organizations that do small spill outreach and edu education. It um, was formed in 1991. They, uh, we uh, do the OILS 911 reporting. You can see this is actually my daughter back when she was about five years old looking at one of our uh, materials, the spills aren't slick uh, signs that are hung in marinas across the West Coast that have the phone number for the OILS 911 so people can call and report spills. Again, POSPIT focuses on small spills, not large spills, and does it primarily through signage and outreach materials. Next slide, please. These are just some of the materials that we put out in the world, um, clean boater kit stuff, things that hang at fuel docks on the pumps to try to get people not to spill and also has the reporting number. And then again, the marina signs that you see on the left-hand side. Next slide. Another thing that the POSPIT members do, and many of them are leads of their organization or jurisdictions clean marina programs. 
and they certify clean marinas and we track the number of certified clean marinas across the West Coast. And generally it's kind of ticking up over time. There were a couple decreases, especially in Oregon with marinas that were lost to the wildfires that Lydia mentioned earlier. Um, but generally it's kind of an uptick of clean marina certifications are happening across our jurisdictions. This is the numbers as of July of this year. Next slide. And last, lastly, I'll just share one of the big accomplishments of 2021 was um, hosting, Hospet hosted this Sailor Sea Green Boating Happy Hour, which was modeled on a very successful effort in California to invite in recreational boaters to learn about uh, best practices for reducing the chances of spilling fuel and keeping the environment clean during the recreational boating activities. We hope to expand this across the West Coast. This was sort of just to see if we could expand it to another region. So in 2022, we hope to have a larger kind of green boating sort of invite educational seminar where recreational boaters can join and get really excellent tips and techniques to reduce their impacts. So back to you, Sarah. Excellent, thank you, Hillary. Um, on we go now to some more of our prevention work. Um, we uh, collect data across the jurisdictions on the volumes of crude transported by vessel, rail, and pipeline and report this out annually. Um, we have created a map that you see on the right that uh, shows all the different pathways by which crude has moved across our, our jurisdictions, again, by a vessel, rail, and pipeline. And if you click on that map, uh, you, would, you would zoom in and you could see actually refineries and other facilities that are listed there as well. This map lives on our website as well as the um, report that we put out every year on the movement of crude across the, the jurisdictions. Um, this year, we are going to start tracking potentially different, different fuels, the renewable fuels that are starting to show up on our radars. So that would likely be another uh, category of fuels that we'll start to track in this movement picture. So um, we'll be staying tuned for that. We also have an oil spill database that's been uh, collecting oil spills since oil spill data since 2002. So we have about a 20 year span of data on um, oil spills of 42 gallons and larger across uh, the Western states. And, and uh, as of this past year, we now have Canada BC's data included as well. Um, so this is just a summary trend graph showing the number of spills in the uh, the, the dark line um, plotted against the volumes released. And if you were to go into our oil spill data report on our website and get a copy of it, we have just in-depth data that's shared in there on the types of volumes, uh, types of material spills, the mediums received, the likely uh, or proposed um, causes. There's just an incredible wealth of data that's in that report. So take a peek uh, when, you, when you can. We also have partnered with NOAA on their Environmental Response Management Application, otherwise known as IRMA. Uh, Pacific Northwest Irma now has um, our, our oil spill data incorporated into it under their response planning um, layer. If you were to click on that in the layers option under the Irma app and drop down, you'll find um, spill location by crude, spill location by medium, spill location by quantity released, as well as by the year. For this little example, I clicked on the spill by quantity released. And this is over the 20 year span, you can see the size of spills that have taken place across um, this portion of the map. Um, if you were to click on one of those dots, you'd get this long lengthy uh, kind of data uh, slice as it were that shows both the source, the location, the time of the spill, um, again, the, the incident of, of what happened, you'll find a wealth of information on each of those dots. So that's um, made it very available to folks who are looking back in historical spills or potentially want to get a sense of what, what the landscape looks like across the region. Um, we also have, for example, on this one shows the spill by medium. So marine water, um, fresh water on land, that sort of thing. 
Um, we also a couple of years ago decided to start tracking small spills, so less than 42 gallons. And in that case, there's really no, um, not a lot of data on the volume of small spills. Sometimes it's just a sheen, sometimes it's um, not recorded. So we decided just to land on the number of spills. So how many small spills compared to large spills. And this is a look at this past year, 2020. And as you can see, you know, small spills really make up a large quantity of the number of spills in our region, um, begging again for you know additional work in the spill prevention realm. Um, the work that POSBIT's doing is great. Just keep up that work in prevention. We'd love to see those blue bars get smaller over time. Uh, in preparedness and response, I'll speak to a few pieces of work going on there. Um, many of you know of the Cascadia Rising exercise. Um, it's the big earthquake um, response and recovery um, pre preparation exercise um, dealing with the Cascadia con con subduction zone. Um, and there's also a parallel effort happening up in British Columbia to explore the impacts of an, a large earthquake up in that region. Um, this Cascadia Rising will also have an oil spill component to it. It has um, scaled down in size from what was originally a, a, a fairly large hands-on types of type of exercise to a virtual uh, tabletop. But we, as a task force, will just continue to track those ex efforts and share out information that we learn and summarize any lessons learned from the exercises for our, our task force members, but also you all. So we'll be kind of keeping an eye on these efforts and again, reporting back what we hear as lessons learned. We have a drills and exercises work group, and this group meets quarterly, um, provides updates to each other on recent drills and exercises. And with this virtual world, there's been a lot of lessons learned on how to run these events um, effectively and meaningfully. Some lessons learned that have come out in this last year have been around recognizing that a hybrid approach is, is probably the most effective going forward in the sense of we do need some people on the ground, but we can also bring in more participants and we can make it work with the hybrid approach, uh, the remote approach um, with a lot of work. <laughs> and the design time is something I've heard from a few of our task force members of putting together a remote, a virtual drill is really time consuming. It takes a lot of extra planning, a lot of extra logistics around the technology and the support. Um, which leads to technology challenges and getting everybody on the right platform and having platforms that are, um, you know, available to communicate across boundaries. And then having a facilitator or a lead who, or sort of a gatekeeper to these platforms who can help move people through and find the appropriate rooms, the breakouts, the, um, the team meeting rooms, that all of those kind of are challenges through trying to do this um, virtual exercise process. However, lots of great lessons learned. And again, our work group spends time talking to each other about, hey, how did it work for you guys? And you know, what do you what do you recommend for us? Um, we also, as a group, have a cross-jurisdictional objectives and requirements document. That means we've looked across the jurisdictions programs for drills and exercises and compiled kind of a summary of key information so that they can look across and see what each other are doing with regard to say, how many, how many drills are you holding a year or how many plan holders do you have, or do you use volunteers in your exercises? This document is available on our website. We wanted to make it something that our task force members could get a chance to sort of look across each other's programs, but also for those who are Outside the task force jurisdictions, it may be of interest to see how, how our drills and exercises are run. With regard to public outreach and communications, um, we have, as Hillary mentioned, um, been doing some roundtables. The green voting was uh, held last spring. These are an opportunity for us to kind of take a little mini, mini you know, an annual meeting moment and do a, do a topical outreach event where we bring in experts on a topic, share out lessons learned, tips, recommendations, and do it all in about a 90 minute webinar. So it's a, a nice, short, but deep enough dive into a topic that we're, um, we're finding these to be very popular and pretty effective. Um, we did one on virtual drills and exercises last spring and summer. Um, we also held one this fall on renewable fuels 
kind of getting a, a download on what are these products, how do they behave, what do we know about them. Um, and going forward, we're going to do a couple more this next winter, spring. Um, Hillary mentioned already, we'll be doing one that's addressing the um, abandoned derelict vessel programs. We also um, have on the docket to do a transboundary spill planning webinar, looking at where we can expand and improve our coordination there, and then possibly one on non-floating oils, kind of the state of the knowledge on those and how response is being handled with these types of um, interesting products. Uh, we have a new annual report just released. Um, this is now posted on our website. It is a basically a snapshot of who we are, kind of our work of the year, and a glimpse at our member agencies. So take a look, and if you'd like a hard copy, give me a shout, and uh, I'll be happy to mail you one. We've had kind of a dry spell of in-person events, of course, due to COVID, but we're really hoping to get back into the saddle with um, meetings at Clean Pacific. We um, attend that usually every every time and have a booth and have um, presentations. And it's always a great event on the West Coast. And we really look forward to supporting Clean Pacific in the years to come. And uh, we'll also try to engage with the International Oil Spill Conference in a in an attendant, attending manner <laughs> in the future as well. Um, those are awesome events, both of those to kind of get the latest and greatest on what's new in the realms of spill prevention response, but also share out what we're doing and uh, get a chance to visit with our partners, our stakeholders and our friends. Um, this is my last slide. This is um, the last time we met in person was two years ago up in Bellingham. We have a few new faces on our squad here, but this is um, all by way of saying, hope to see you again in person. Um, we will probably continue our annual meetings with some virtual capacity so that we can continue to bring in folks who can't travel or be able to make it accessible if you don't want to travel, but we really hope to see you and all your um, warm smiley faces again soon. So with that, I will end my show here, um, but I would like to invite Hillary back on. There we are, sorry, just gonna move my um, camera over here so I can be facing the right direction. Yeah, so um, one last note uh, with regard to the executive coordinator team. Um, I will be leaving, departing from the task force at the end of this year. Um, I'm both sad and excited to be moving on, but it's time. And I'm thrilled to announce that Hillary will be staying on as a task force um, member, member of the coordinating committee. And we've also hired a new member, Meg Harris, who will be kind of replacing my role as the face to the um, task force executive member team, and also working with Hillary on most all of the projects we've got underway and so forth. So I'd like to invite Meg to flip on her camera. And if you'd like to say a word or two, Meg, and then I'll hand it over to Hillary. You're, met, you're still muted. Like you're on mute, but I'm going to also push you on pause because I want to actually interview you. Oh, so, yes. <laughs> you can put yourself on mute again. So I also want to do a time check. It's 12.15 and, yeah. you know, it's lunchtime. So we're going to do a super quick introduction of Meg and then when we come back from lunch, we're going to spend a few more minutes on this. But um, very bittersweet to say goodbye to Sarah and we're going to do a more kind of formal goodbye to her when we come back after lunch but I do want to welcome Meg we are thrilled to have Meg coming in to fill Sarah's very ample shoes as the task force executive coordinator lead and I will of course support her as I have supported Sarah for the past 10 years. Um, Meg comes to us from the Whatcom Conservation District in Washington State and in that capacity she's been facilitating some transboundary water quality forums and work groups she has a background in environmental toxicology, which is very interesting. This is one of these rare people who I personally appreciate deeply, who comes from kind of the hard physical sciences realm in a very relevant field for <laughs> the oil spill work that we're all here to talk about, but has a passion for the work around facilitating, coordinating, communicating, engaging people in the dialogue that's necessary to move the issue forward. And that is why we brought her on board to be the new task force executive coordinator. I am super excited to work with her. And with that, Meg, you are officially introduced and now you can say a few words and then we'll send people off to lunch. Awesome, thank you, Sarah and Hillary. Um, 
I just want to say hi, and I'm super excited to be joining both the team at VEDA and the task force. Um, big shoes to fill with Sarah leaving, but i um, excited to work with you guys all in the coming years. Yay. Thank you. Great, Meg. Thanks a lot. And come back, everybody, at 1, oh boy, what's our 1.15, and we will be picking up where we left off this afternoon. Uh, maybe plan to get back into your seats a few minutes before then so we can start right at 1.15, and you won't miss a minute of this fabulous afternoon lineup. So go forth, have a great lunch. And I did see a few questions came in and in the chat and in the Q&A, and I will respond to those during the lunch break, so we won't miss any interest people had on the sessions we just heard. So thank you all. And we will be back in an hour. <laughs>